Welcome to Sense and Sensibility, the Inflation Guy podcast. I am Michael Ashton. I am the Inflation Guy and I am your host. Today's topic, stagflation from a monetarist's perspective. So, stagflation is an overused term. Okay, we see it all the time these days. What it basically means is very low growth or recession with high and or rising inflation. The classic example in the United States being the 1970s when we introduced something called the misery index. That was the combination of inflation and unemployment to measure how bad these the economy was in these two dimensions. Now... You have to recognize, before we get into talking about how a monetarist would think about stagflation and the problem of stagflation, we have to recognize that it's sort of a conundrum from a Keynesian perspective. From a Keynesian perspective, and I know I'm oversimplifying because the only way you can salvage Keynesianism is by making it super complex and adding all kinds of strange rules, but the basic idea of Keynesianism is that inflation is caused by too much demand. So an explanation from a Keynesian of why you get stagflation is typically pretty tortured about how, you know, well, there was this strange combination of of unfortunate events that came together to look like this, uh, but it doesn't really invalidate the basic idea of inflation being caused by too much demand. And similarly, the you get a similarly tortured explanation uh, when you find a Keynesian trying to explain the opposite of stagflation, uh, deflation with full employment, like we had in Japan for much of the last 30 years, very low or negative inflation and more or less, an economy more or less at full employment. So, For a monetarist, these conditions are much easier to explain, but for a Keynesian, this is really a challenge. So how do I explain this from a monetarist perspective? So always when we're talking about monetarism, we go back to the equation of exchange, MV equals PQ, with the equals being that funny little triple equals, that means that they're definitionally definitionally the same. M being money supply, V being the velocity of money, P being the price level and Q being uh, real output. And we can look at the equation, obviously, uh, with differences so that that the change in the money supply plus the change in money velocity is equal, roughly, uh, to the change in prices, that is inflation, plus the change in real output, that is growth. So on the left side, the MV, these these are central bank decisions, effectively. The central bank can, with open market operations, that is buying and selling bonds and either on a permanent basis adding to the portfolio or repurchasing them on a temporary basis adding to the portfolio. With with these open market operations, the central bank can effectively choose the level of M that it wants. Not exactly. There are other things. There are the money multiplier moves, but but essentially uh, you can... The central bank has great control over the level of money. And furthermore, with with interest rate policy, a central bank can, although with less specificity, uh, to be sure, can choose the level of money velocity it wants. If it wants a higher money velocity, it can raise interest rates. Now, obviously, these two things kind of work at odds. If you have, if you increase the money supply too fast, then it's very hard to push interest rates higher. But, but these are two levers that the central bank has and can actually do something with. So the central bank, by moving these levers, can effectively choose, essentially choose the GDP level that it wants. Okay, because the right side of this equation, PQ, is nominal GDP. Okay, so the nominal total output uh, in uh, of all goods and services in a year. Now, that sounds like great power. So the nominal GDP, PQ, um, again, the amount of real output times the price level of that output. But these are not central bank decisions. And the central bank has very little, if any, power over the division of nominal GDP between P and Q. So 
the question then is what causes P and Q? Because that's the stagflation side of this, this equation, right? If P is high and Q is super low, um, you know, under what conditions do we get that? Do we get really high P changes in P and really low changes in Q? That stagflation, what causes that? So first, let's talk about something called money illusion, because this potentially can play a role. If money supply goes way up, that's M, and we want prices to remain relatively stable, uh, then that requires at least some sort of money illusion. Because if you'll remember back to the Diamond Water Paradox podcast uh, that I did a, a podcast or two ago, um, if you increase the amount of money relative to stuff, remember I said, if you increase the amount of money relative to stuff, then money should become less valuable. In the same way with the diamond water paradox, if you dramatically increase the supply of diamonds relative to water, then diamonds would get much cheaper relative to water than they are. Okay, so similarly, and this was part of the upshot of that, of that episode, which is worth reviewing, if you increase the amount of money relative to stuff, then money should get less valuable. If it doesn't, and and if therefore money supply, the money supply really increases a lot and prices don't, it means that people are perceiving they're getting more money in their pocket, more dollars in their pocket for no reason of their own. They didn't work any harder to suddenly, you know, money dropped from heaven or whatever. And in they're perceiving that extra money to be actual wealth. They're not perceiving it as a dilution that that exactly offsets the amount of extra money that they got. Okay, so they actually think it's real wealth. Now, there's some debate, and that's called money illusion, that I have more money and I have this illusion of being wealthier. I'm not really wealthier because this is, there's the same amount of stuff out there. And because there's more money, I have particularly if, if it's divided evenly, I have a parapassu claim, exactly the same amount of claim on those assets as I did prior, those goods and services. And therefore, with more money, it means that the price of those goods and services should go up. And if it doesn't, that means that I'm under the illusion that I'm wealthier. Now, there's debate on to what extent money illusion actually operates in the real world. There have been all kinds of, of experiments done about money illusion. And, and, and that really isn't sort of today's topic, so I'm not going to go into great detail. Suffice to say that large money illusion, you know, massive changes in money and everybody acting like it didn't happen seems to be very, very rare and very, very hard to do. Small money illusion seems to be something that you can induce uh, ex experimentally at least and and it sort of seems to happen. So I, I think in my own personal opinion, uh, unsubstantiated with any data that I'm providing you right now, but just all of my uh, all of my years of reading the stuff, I think that there is some sort of money illusion going on. But if we have a very large increase in money and no increase in prices, then you have to have a lot of money illusion. But let's just leave that there for now. W what else determines this mix of P versus Q? Okay, the uh, change in prices versus the change in, in GDP. Well, one of the things is output limits, right? So if the potential supply, if potential Q, uh, if the, the we, we're producing all we possibly can, and so Q is maxed out somehow um, and is constrained, then a rise in MV has to be reflected in P, uh, there's just no other place for it to go. We can't actually create any more Q. So therefore, if we increase money supply too fast then uh, and, and velocity doesn't go down, then you have to have prices go up. If there, Now, here's where it gets sort of funny. If you have output limits and you have money illusion, okay, so you, you know, Q can't go up anymore, and P isn't going up anymore because people have this money illusion, so they're not pressing prices higher, then the only thing that can happen, keeping in mind MV equals PQ is an identity, we've moved three of those variables, and the only thing that can happen at that point is velocity has to go down. And that's temporary, uh, but that is, that's sort of where that set of circumstances has to show up, that you get money illusion and you get a limitation in output, money velocity temporarily 
goes down because it has to. Um, as this is an identity. Velocity is a plug number anyway. We know kind of what drives it at some level, but there are circumstances un under which it, it moves simply because it's the only thing that can move in this equation. Now, it, it can happen that there's also coincidentally other things that are, are also working to lower money velocity. For example, if there's an increase in the demand for, in the precautionary demand for cash balances because everyone's afraid and so they want to hold more cash, that lowers money velocity. And so you can get a circumstance, and this isn't probably very far from our current circumstance, where there's some money illusion and there's output constraints and there's some precautionary demand for money that pushes velocity down. And so we can have a large increase in money supply and at least temporarily get away with not too bad inflation, although we clearly are seeing it now. So, you know, output limits is sort of one way that you can uh, screw up P versus Q. If you have lots of money supply growth and you don't have lots of of money illusion, then, and, and you have constraint on the output side, then you end up with inflation. What else can happen? So we, uh, industrial policy also can help to determine the division between prices and real output. Uh, the Fed can't, can't change the limits to productive growth, but Congress and the administration can. So, for example, you know, the Congress and the administration can, can by pursuing a smaller regulatory footprint that can increase the equilibrium growth or perhaps the the uh, Congress could institute uh, tax incentives for research and development that would increase the equilibrium sort of the maximum real output growth the potential growth that we could have um, a lower tax burden in general, is an increased incentive for growth and a decreased incentive for tax losses. So again, that tends to move the the, the balance more towards Q than from P. Uh, on the other hand, there can be disincentives to work or disincentives to hire that that will tend to lower Q relative to P. So, so the right side of the equation, the PQ, at least part of it, you can sort of think of as as being uh, the fiscal, the federal side of things, where where industrial policy sorts of, of decisions and taxation policy can affect the P versus Q. And here's where we're kind of in a bit of a, a bad place right now because we clearly have made on, on the right side of the equation, we've made decisions that at least right now are tending to depress the potential output growth, real output growth, which means that for a given level of money supply growth, you're going to tend to have more inflation. And by the way, that's what happened in the 70s. Part of what happened in the 70s, obviously, there was lots and lots of money supply growth, but there was also really rotten industrial policy that, that tended to screw up a lot of these things and cause real growth to be low and price increases to be high. Finally, we, could, we also can look at global developments or lucky or unlucky breaks, if you want to think about it that way. So, for example, for a long time in the 90s and, and 2000s, globalization change the available trade-off of P versus Q in a positive way. Um, it was, you know, for any given amount of, of growth or any given amount of money growth, you could get potentially more real output growth because there was this, there was this, out, this outlet valve, if you will, um, of globalization. And, uh, and deglobalization, or worse, war, has the opposite effect and, and makes the trade-off between P and Q worse as opposed to better. So what's the current situation? So right now, we have too much money supply growth. And, and although the, money, the growth in the money supply is changing, it, it is decelerating, rather, um, it's still too high. And, you know, if you have... If you had stable money velocity and you have potential real growth of, say, let's be generous, 3%, and you want inflation of 2%, then kind of by definition, you need to have money growth of around 5 Now, if you believe velocity is going to go down forever, then maybe you can run money supply growth a little faster. But there's, there's a limit there. You need to have money supply growth over time 
be around five, six, something like that. And it's still way, 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 way faster than that. It's not 25% anymore, but it's still way, way faster than that. And so that's still a problem. Now, on the positive side, the Fed is keeping rates low, and that does constrain money velocity. It's not, you know, going to to surge higher on because of interest rates. Um, but to continue the decline in money velocity, you would need to have rates go even lower, and that's sort of hard. Um, or you would need uh, lots of panic and people needing to hold lots more cash. And those are the two ways that, that you can sort of mechanically create lower money velocity. Um, so if we see money velocity decline further from here, it, it's more likely a sign that there's more money illusion working than we really, than we really believe is out there. Um, but that's sort of that's sort of where we are in the money velocity. I, I think my belief is that money velocity will rebound uh, over the next couple of quarters, the next five, six, seven quarters, as the precautionary demand for cash balances declines, as people get more comfortable, as the uh, as COVID gets into the rearview mirror more and more, and people say that all these nice cash balances that the government has been so wonderful to drop into our, our bank accounts, we can start to spend those and not hoard them so much. Current situation, we still we have Q output that is constrained by industrial policy right now, uh, significant disincentives to work. It's also constrained by deglobalization and by other supply constraints, uh, and the, those other supply constraints happening because we had this rapid growth of demand that outstripped the recovery of the supply chain. So that is that is something which is temporary. It's transitory. It will eventually end. But those supply constraints um, are, are, are real, and they constrain how fast Q can grow, which means, again, if you have a certain amount of money supply growth and Q is constrained, that means more inflation. And so... As a result of this, the price level is rising. Inflation is 4 or 5%, whether you're looking at core or headline inflation. And that's not surprising. That is, that is what we would expect given this collection of circumstances. Moreover, I don't see that there is anything in the very short term that's going to change in those circumstances. There doesn't seem to be any real strong move by the Fed to... to you know, well, gee, maybe they'll taper, but to actually reduce liquidity and slow money supply growth, I see very little interest in doing that. So maybe supply, you know, again, slowing it below twenty-five percent, maybe slowing it below ten percent, probably not so much, and that is a, a fundamental problem. Um, so that's sort of where I, I see things today. I, this is the reason that I believe that inflation in this country are, is going to stay high through. Uh, certainly the early part of next year, 2022, and, and quite likely further than that. Um, so that's kind of where I believe that we are at the moment, and that's the monetarist view of stagflation. If we get to stagflation here, something that we would really call stagflation, it's, uh, it's not, it should not be a surprise to us. We're doing all the right things. If we want to cause stagflation, we're doing the right things. That's our episode for today. I want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments that you want to direct uh, to me, you can get our the Inflation Guy app that's available in both the Google Store and the, the Apple Store. Or you can go to EnduringInvestments.com and go to the, the comment form, the contact form, and fill that out, and I will get back to you for sure. I'd like to know what you're thinking. I'd like to know what you think about this particular episode and what else you'd like to hear from the Inflation Guy. Thanks for tuning in to Sense and Sensibility, the Inflation Guy podcast. I am Michael Ashton. I am the Inflation Guy. Defend your money. If inflation is coming for you, remember, you know a guy. Remember, you know a guy.